in their equipment, turn to page 21 in your uh, workbook, uh, your study manual. And uh, I think we're at the bottom of page 21 where it's called Foolish Disciples. And this is the last section, last part of section 1 or chapter 1. And then we're going to have the study questions possibly tonight. So I hope you've done them. Um, all right. The scripture at the bottom of that page, we'll just read it. It's out of Luke 24, verse 25 through 27. <clears throat> then said he unto them, O fools... And slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. <clears throat> all right, so um, I really hadn't read this, this part here, and I, I don't know that I will... Uh, mention what I'm thinking about. I thought I would look to see if I've got something written here, which I doubt that I do. Um, it's interesting, in Ma I think it's in Matthew 5, where Jesus says to call no man a fool. Anybody familiar with that? Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, it is, Matthew 5, 22. But I say unto you, whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of judgment, and whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council, but whosoever shall say, thou fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. Well, basically, Jesus just did that. <clears throat> no. O fools and slow of heart, to believe all that is written. <clears throat> and you'll find that Paul uses that phrase too. <clears throat> so what is that telling us? I mean, is it telling us that, uh, you know, Jesus, whatever Jesus says, you can't really trust it because it, you know, or can you say, would you think that maybe, well, Jesus thinks you can't do it, but he can do it. Are we thinking... <clears throat> that there is magic or curses in what we say instead of it being inherent in the Lord. Inherent in the Lord. That the only thing holy, the only thing virtuous on this planet when Jesus came was Jesus. Okay. Anybody ever feel like a failure? Anybody ever feel like you you come short of the glory of God? Anybody feel like, you know, <clears throat> well, guess what? All those feelings are true. <clears throat> but there's some good news. What is the good news? Jesus. But not Jesus in heaven, and this is what we covered in the last section. Jesus in us. And so if you say to somebody... Thou fool, or you fool, do you think you're going to go to hell for using that order of words? And the answer is no, because Jesus used them, and Paul used them, and other people used them. God, man looks on the outward appearance. You could even say man listens on the outward appearance. <laughs> but God looks on the heart. And what, you know, Jesus said it's not, you know, it's not, what comes out of you that goes into the draught, it's what comes out of your heart that comes through your mouth and whatever. <clears throat> he wants to change our heart, not just change the wording that we use. Because I know people, for example, I mean, let's just stick with the scriptures. The Pharisees could, you know, they said everything just right. Man, they looked holy and they acted holy and they spoke like they were holy and everything else. They didn't even know Jesus. They didn't even recognize Jesus. They were so religious that they missed Jesus. Did you hear what I said? 
They were so religious that they missed Jesus. Jesus is hanging out with the sinners. He's hanging out with the people who've messed up. He's, ha he's, he's hanging out with the outcasts because why? Because they need him and they believe in him for more than a religion. More than a religious set of words, more than a religious set of doctrines, but having the life that pleases the Father, that life will say the right words. <clears throat> and that life will accomplish the right things. Now, it may not always look right to a religious person. When they were accusing Jesus and his disciples of, of eating grain in the field, and they said, you can't do that on the Sabbath. And, and Jesus used other examples from the Old Testament and said, well, what about David? He ate the showbread, and that wasn't legal. And what about the priests when they did stuff that wasn't legal for them to do? Well, they couldn't answer it because these things are not primarily based on deeds. Now, you've heard me say this before, and I'll say it a million times because it's worth it. <clears throat> a Buddhist will be work to be patient. He will try to be kind. He will try to show love. He will give of what his possessions. He will do all of those things more than any Christian I've seen. Is there virtue in doing those things? Is he earning anything with God by doing those things? And the answer is no. I mean, why do we serve Jesus if it's just, you know, I mean, we could just go to Buddha or, you know, become Hindus or whatever, you know. The answer is God put his son within us and what is produced by the vine through us as branches is called fruit. And everything else is just us doing religious stuff. Amen. Now let me tell you something. If you ever get that, it'll make your search singular. <clears throat> You'll search for Jesus. You'll go to the word for Jesus. Your cry will be for Jesus. You're, you're, you won't be as concerned about you as you will be concerned that it be Christ. Amen. That it be Christ. Because that's the only hope. Because it is. He is. He is the only hope. And so it, our search, we don't have to search for righteousness. Jesus has made unto us righteousness. We don't have to worry about our redemption. He has made unto us redemption. We don't have to worry about peace. He is our peace. I mean, I'm just quoting scriptures here. All of this is out of the scripture, and I can go on and on and on and on. He is this, he is that, he's the way, he's the truth, he's the life, he's the, you know, divine. He's, the, he's all of these things. He's the bread of life. He's all of these things. And when Christ captivates your heart, then when Jesus is walking on the road to Emmaus and he says, Oh fools, oh foolish ones, you can be assured that he's not headed for hell. Amen? Not only that, not only that, but you can be assured that God is ordering this particular wording whether they liked it or not. I mean, do you think that Jesus would use inappropriate words for his disciples? I would say no. Sadly, they're very appropriate. Oh, foolish ones. Slow of heart to believe all that is written. Most Christians cannot take that kind of talk. Yeah, they don't want to hear it. You know why? Because... There's a scripture that says, not to think more highly of yourself than you ought. It offends us. Why? Because we think more highly of ourselves. In, in defending the scripture, well, you use the word fool. You called us a fool, and Jesus said to call no man a fool. Well, Jesus also said, you know, the scriptures also said, not to think more highly of yourself than you ought, and your reaction is based on that. You're, you're, you're defending truths while violating other truths. 
Now, this all is easy to do unless we just keep our hearts after Jesus. Don't get complicated. We make everything so complicated. I remember... I remember in my early days as I began to see Jesus in the scriptures. And I remember saying, gosh, he is so profound and yet so simple. Can, can you believe it? Can, is that possible? Yes. Because we shouldn't be removed from the simplicity that is, of the gospel that is Christ. If you walk in the light that you have, and here's where complications come when you try to walk in, say, my light. You know, I'm having a tough time with that. <laughs> Walking in what I've seen. Okay. So I imagine you would really be having a hard time. Just because I teach doesn't mean that I'm putting expectations on you to live up to my level, you know. Now, my hope is that you'll all surpass me one day and be so far beyond me that I'll look like a, a suck in my thumb and go, woo-hoo. You go, I remember I used to think he was so deep. He's an idiot, you know, or a fool. How about that? <laughs> Good. But until that day comes, I'm, when I teach, I'm not putting expectations on you. I send forth the word as the Lord gives it and tells me. And the seeds fall. And the seeds are in there. And it may take a while for him to water them, fertilize it, and everything else. You know, I don't know. Anybody ever done much gardening or, or stuff like that? You know, you, you know how about... Uh, has anybody ever had a, a, you know what a redwood tree is? Anybody ever had a redwood seed and put it in the ground? And go back the next day and go, well, where is it? You know, I mean, the redwood, you can cut a hole in it and drive a car through it. It takes a while. It takes a while. Be patient, therefore, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. And that's not just talking about in the sky. Unto the Lord coming in us. Amen. For the farmer has long patience Amen. until he receive both the early and the latter rain. I'm just quoting from the book of James right now. By the way, I don't sit here and go, I don't sit here and turn to a bunch of scriptures, but I am quoting scriptures all the time. I want you to know that I am firing scriptures all the time. I just don't always make it clear that that's what I'm doing. All right. So this thing, well, let's read the paragraph here. Jesus referred to his own disciples as foolish ones. This is a very hard thing for many believers to accept. These are disciples who love Jesus, who talk of him, who are faithful to him, who have served him. They have gone through many things with him. In light of all this and in light of all the faith that it took those disciples to do all that they did, how could they understand one who would call his own disciples foolish? Now, one reason why these kind of things impact me is because I'm always putting myself in that situation and then thinking what would I think if I was walking with Jesus after three years of being faithful and he turned around and he said, oh, foolish one. <laughs> and before I even am actually in the situation but have only sort of put myself there, I can already see what my reaction would be. In other words, he doesn't have to put me in every situation. I put myself in that situation and go, you know what, I'd be responding in my flesh right now. <coughs> I'd be going, how can you do that? <laughs> you should be rebuking the bad people. We've been with you. Can I get amen? You know. That would, be, that would be us reacting and defending ourselves instead of us listening to the master, listening to the Lord and saying, yes, Lord, you see beyond what I see. You know what I don't know. I, my goal is not that I understand everything you say, 
My goal is that I am with you. I am not going to throw a fit. And that, you know, because I mean, you could, if, could you imagine Jesus walking along with these disciples? He says, oh, foolish. And then one of them throws himself in the dirt, starts kicking, and yeah, why are you doing that? And everything else. And then Jesus has to spend an hour counseling with him just to get him up and moving again. You see what I'm saying? So I say this. I don't, I don't even know where you're coming from, but I know you. You, you, did you hear what I said? I don't, I don't have it all figured out what you just said, but I still know you, and I believe in you, and so I'm going to be with you. And while others may, you know, throw fits in the flesh and want Jesus to, because this happens, you know, and, and there's no, you know, Jesus ministers to our needs. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about just flat digging our heels in the ground and saying, I'm not going to move until you straighten this out in my mind. Do you understand? Straighten this out in your mind? Good luck. Yeah, that's right. You know, man, I wouldn't even want to go in there. <laughs> you know, who knows what all lurks in there? <clears throat> so, uh, the next paragraph, as if labeling his own disciples were not enough, Jesus went on to describe them as slow of heart to believe all. It was not that they did not believe some or even much. But Jesus felt that they did not believe all. They may have been quick to believe some things of God. There's a slowness to believe all. How could we understand Jesus saying this to us if we have been so faithful? Knowing that our love toward him has been genuine, how can we understand these words except to conclude that Jesus must be cruel and hard? And there are people who believe that Jesus is cruel and hard. I don't. You know, I do not. I, you know, I wrote a song a couple of months ago or maybe six months ago, maybe a year ago, I don't know. And in that it says, everything you do, you do with love. And, and I really believe that. I just believe it. It may not feel like love, you know. What, what did David say? In his mercy he hath afflicted me. Well, that's somebody who's seeing beyond the circumstances and beyond their, their own pride. Because, you know, I'm just going to tell you, we're not going to get anywhere until we get past our own pride. I mean, we're going to, or, 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 I can't say not get anywhere. Our progress will be slow. We'll make, you know, Lord loves us and he'll do whatever he can because he is good and because he does love us. But to really make strides with the Lord, you have to give up your pride. You have to give up resisting the Lord over things that we don't really understand, but he does. And we have to say, that's why I call you Lord. That's why you're, you know, Lord. So, uh, could it be rather that Jesus has another view? Could it be that he sees everything differently than we do? Could it be that the disciples have not yet reached the weightier matters? Could it be that there are issues dear to his heart that are not so dear to Christianity or churchanity and that what is dear to them is not at all in that vein that touches his heart? Would it not be interesting to find that instead of being of him being critical or hard, he simply speaks the truth as it is. If this be the case, then Jesus' words were not proceeding from a critical attitude, though they could be read that way. Rather, he must simply declare reality, and these disciples stood at the edge of entering into that reality. And here's the good news. These guys did see Jesus. A shout should have gone up right there, you know. These guys did see Jesus. They... They, you know, you say, well, if Jesus has to say to us, oh, slow of heart to believe in everything, then we ain't going to get it. They got it, and pretty quick. Isn't that cool? And here's why. Because the Lord, you know, the Lord knew that they were open. 
you know, we always feel like we're closed. We always feel like we're, you know, half-hearted or something like that. I mean, you know, I've told the story, I haven't told it in a long time, but I told the story of somebody coming to my office once for counseling, and they said, oh, my God, I, they were crying and just got me broken hearted. I think I've committed the unpardonable sin. I think the Lord is going to leave me, and it's over with, and everything, and they're just going on and on and on. And I said, hey, there's no question. And I didn't even ask them what they'd done or anything. I said, there's no question you haven't committed the unpardonable sin because you still care. You are broken over this. You want the Lord. You're not all hard and separate and, you know, everything. But someone who is actually broken and cares feels sometimes that they're not where they want to be or should be. You know what I mean? Why am I saying that? Because sometimes those are signs that we really are with the Lord. You know, I mean, the, the, you know, the day that you just go, oh, I don't care about that Bible. I don't care about the Lord. I don't want to, I don't want to hear nothing about him. You should start worrying. Okay. But when you say, I really do want to know the Lord, you're probably closer than you could ever imagine. <laughs> Isn't that good news to anybody? Amen. Praise God. And the Lord sees our heart. He's not, you know, um, we're, you know, he's not going to fall off the throne. We're not going to fall out of his hands. Okay. He's got us. He's got us. <clears throat> um, we must conclude that Jesus has a right to pass judgment on his own disciples if their hearts fail to comprehend and receive the value of his new relationship to them. And notice the value. There is a, I want you to know that there is a value of, to having a father that will tell you the truth when it's not comfortable. Or a husband that will tell you the truth when it's not comfortable. Or a pastor that will tell you the truth when it's not comfortable. But we'll do it in love because I believe we should speak the truth, but I believe we should speak the truth in love. Now, that doesn't mean, oh, you know, you're, you're really messed up, but I love you. You know, I'm not talking about, you know, sloppy agape. I'm talking about, yeah. It's right. really hard when I'm, when I'm with the Lord. It's really hard for me to share that. Oh, I don't of course. want to share that. Right. It's, it's, I'm reluctant to share that because I don't want it to come down on people because I feel like that that's, you know, I mean, I just, it's my, my desire to be soft towards them and to be encouraging. So I come reluctantly but obediently to deliver that. And, and that there's something of the Lord that comes through in that that I, I can observe that comes through in that instead of. Right. I'm going to tell you something, and you need to hear this. You know, there's a difference in spirit there. Yeah, there is. Well, for me, I mean, it's gotten to the point where um, if God gives me something for somebody, no matter how hard it is or how difficult or whatever, I know that this is good for them, and it's going to really get them to the Lord in a way that they weren't before. And it is the loving arms of the Father reaching out to them, going, you know, I love you and I want you closer and that sort of thing. So in my heart, it's, it's not even hard anymore unless, unless the person's just out and out resisting. But if, but if they're anywhere open at all, I'm blessed to go, guess what? You know, God loves you. And he's got a couple of things that I believe he wants to open your eyes to that's going to just open new doors and it's going to be better than it was before. I really believe that this, 
If it's really from God, this is going to bless their life. Unless pride rules. Uh, who had their hand up? Somebody? Yeah. Right. And the, the person would see it like, the look on their face was like, you're reading my mail. You know? And it was just like, it was. You know, that's a federal offense. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and that's exactly right. You know, and, and it was a humbling thing to the person, but you could see that the, the heart was like, <sighs> just like, you're exactly very sober and it's quiet and right. And that, that was it. Yeah. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. Well, and a lot of it has to do with the attitude that we come in. <clears throat> because I've had people come to me and they, had, they said, I've got something from the Lord. And basically when they spoke, now this isn't the words they said, but this is what it sounds like. God hates you and you're a failure. And, you know, I mean, and, they're just, and, they're just, and they feel like they've got a billy club and they're just beating you and everything. And then they walk off and I just, I'm like <laughs> bloody. And, oh, just, well, thank you, Jesus. <clears throat> All right, last paragraph on 22. Perhaps all the sermons and messages we have heard and preached before this time in our lives were truly important, but the goal is not to be impressed or to impress others. What Jesus thinks should be more important than what others think. He must have thought that the disciples' view of things appeared foolish in light of the living revelation that stood before them of which they were ignorant. In other words, whatever they had experienced for three and a half years walking with Jesus, he was right there, and they still didn't see him. They still weren't seeing him. So he's not upset, but he's going, look, you still got a way to go. You don't see me. I'm right here. And, and that's another factor I don't think I deal with. Maybe I do. Well, I probably do in this, but uh, somewhere. But um, this fact that the disciples are walking, the disciples now, this isn't unbelievers. The disciples are walking along saying Jesus is not with us anymore. He's gone, and Jesus is right there. Now, here's my point. A lot of times we feel like Jesus isn't with us, and he's right there. Can you believe that? Can, can you believe it? Do you have to have the feelings of it? Do you have to have the what I call the present presence of it? I lived for years on the present presence. That would either be I could sense the presence of the Lord or he gave me some new revelation that carried me for weeks or months or hours. <laughs> but th there was a, a present presence with it. And then the Lord cut that off from me and said, I don't want you going by that. I want you to know me, to know I'm there, not based on how it feels at this moment. Right. Amen? Amen? Not based on how it feels. And, and it gives him more honor when you don't feel it and you say, you know what? I still believe in you. I'm with you. The Lord is right here. Yes. Right. <laughs> you know, the Lord is right here. You know, and the, can you hear the other disciple? Where? Where is he? You're crazy, dude. He died. On, he's not with us. We're on our own. 
Now, you may not have another brother or sister standing beside you doing that, but you probably got somebody in your head doing that. You know? What are you talking about? Get real. Just be real for a minute. He's not here. You have to believe. Folks, faith is all he asks. Just believe, you know? And the good news, if you believe not, he's still faithful. Another shout should have gone. Because if, if you believe not, he is faithful to you. He is faithful. Well, let's put it this way. He's faithful. The Father is faithful to the Son. The Son is faithful to what he accomplished. And what he accomplished is you are one with him. I don't feel the presence of the Lord. I don't feel he's close. You are closer than close. You know? I mean, they might be bumping elbows with Jesus. Well, they didn't have it as good as we do. He's in us. He is with us. He's in us. God, folks, the term Emmanuel is God with us. God with us being, in tra uh, being truly translated in the New Testament is God in us. We're the body of Christ. We're not the friends in the sense of the, the hippie, the Jesus freaks thought, you know, I mean, we did, you know. Uh, me and Jesus got a groovy thing going. I mean, I said that. I said stuff like that. I mean, you know, G uh, people ask you, you know, well, what is Jesus to you? Jesus is my best friend. He is my best friend. Folks, he's more than my best friend. Now. He's my life. He's everything. He's my peace. He's my... He, he is all of those things, and I believe that even when I don't have the sense of peace. Do you think that it insults the devil and glorifies Jesus when you have no sense of peace and you turn to the enemy who's mocking you and you say, Jesus is my peace whether I feel it or not. Jesus on the throne going, that's my son right there. And the devil's going, are you an idiot? You, you're making him mad. You know, anybody, I mean, has the devil ever made you mad? Well, get back at him a few times by standing up for the truth. <laughs> you know, we used to call it giving the devil a black eye. That's what we call it. When you stood in faith, now that is just a term we applied to, standing in faith in the face of no peace or no patience or no love and saying, he is that to me. He is that in me. And I've still got it whether I feel it or act like it or not. Bam! I just gave the devil a black eye. Bless you. All right. Um, the goal then is to walk this road with him until we begin to see him in a whole different way than we have before. All right, now let me just say that. See, I'm, we're not making too big of progress. But seeing him in a whole different way, yes, yes, yes. The, the height of that is that the revelation of Christ be so powerful that, you know, it's like the sun comes up and we go, and oh, my God. But, folks, that's the height of that. To walk and... and on this road until we begin to see him in a whole different light than we did before, though, is this simple. It's not that great revelation I just described. It's this simple. He says he's in me. He says I'm one with him. He says he'll never leave me nor forsake me. He says, you know, he said in his word, greater is he that's in me. He said that. So, you know, anybody ever, you know, follow the faith movement at all? You know? Where you stood when, when you were sick and you believed for healing even when you didn't feel like it? Anybody ever go through any of that kind of stuff? Well, it's the same faith. It's just a different object. That was for healing. This is for the truth that is d dearest to his heart. Healing is, de is dearest to our body. This truth is dearest to his heart, where we 
say what he wants us to say because we love him, because we believe him. And we're saying with every ounce of it, I mean, if, see, if we were drugged before a throne, and there's our Jesus, and there's our Father, and the devil's going, just deny him. You don't feel nothing. You don't have any peace. You'd, you'd look at the Father, and you'd look at the Son, and you'd look at the devil doing it, and you'd go, I don't have to have any peace. I don't have to feel it. Get behind me, Satan. Amen. Can I get amen? We would, that's what we would do. Well, that's where we are, folks. We are before the throne in that sense. We are one with Jesus. We have come boldly into there, and we've done it. You know, most people go to the throne, but not boldly. They go, oh, Lord, I messed up. I'm terrible. I'm a, you know, and, and, you know, there's no boldness to it. The boldness comes when you're one. The boldness comes when you believe. And when you believe, God sees your faith, and he moves, but he only moves by faith. And not only that, if he didn't move outwardly in any way, shape, or form, by speaking forth what you truly believe, it, it does what? It quickens. He quickens the dead. You know, he doesn't quicken the living. He quickens the dead. Well, how, what do you got to do to qualify to be quickened? Not just ruined, dead, you know, messed up to the death degree. Well, that's where, that's where this reality comes in, where, where you're bringing glory to God. But we don't see it like that. We say, I'm, I'm on the job, or I'm here and there, and, I got, you know, and the devil is standing there, and he's saying his stuff, and then the Lord is with us and everything. And, but we're not seeing it as it truly is. We're just seeing it like, well, I'm... I guess I don't have it, or, you know, I don't know how many directions you can go with that, but I mean, there's a bunch, you know, you know what I'm saying? I mean, we, because everybody's different, you take it a different angle, but the bottom line is we're slow of heart and slow to believe all of it. We believe, you know, and there's certain things that we believe that we're like a pit bull or we won't let go of. There's other stuff. He goes, <laughs> you know, right? I mean, it just, it just comes along and hits us. Believe it all. Believe it right up to the throne and into his lap and then into him in oneness. And know that that will never change in his heart. What I've always said is God will never change. The devil will never change, so you better. You know, the Lord's not going to change, but the devil won't either. You're going to be the one that's going to have to change from receiving his thoughts and receiving, uh, I'm going to say it like this, the, an anti-gospel. Because it really is. It's, it is. It is believing that we don't believe. It is believing that we don't have what he says we have. It is believe. See, because you're believing. You're not unbelieving. You're believing. You're believing you don't have it. I mean, you know, because our faith it is, you know, I mean, we will respond according to what we believe. And if we believe that we don't believe something, <laughs> then, you know, it ends up coming our way because we're not standing on the truth. We're not standing on the cross. We're not standing on the throne. We're not standing on the word. We're not standing on, on the true thought of Jesus toward his bride and toward his body. We're not standing on the thought of a father who did all of this and of Jesus who did all of this so we could be one so that we wouldn't have to worry with these things. I mean, the difference between the old covenant and the new covenant is this. He's wanting us to make the leap. He's wanting us to not be Jews anymore. You know? 
I mean, my friend, I've had many a Jewish friend say, well, why aren't you ministering to the Jews? And why aren't you in a, in a, a Jewish uh, Christian temple and all that since, you know, you have Jewish background and everything? I said, you know, I left all that. <laughs> I, when Jesus rose from the dead, I left all of that. No longer Greek, no longer Jew, no longer these things, but Christ now is all. And I happen to believe that. They said, yeah, but think of the benefits. Everybody loves the Jews and people treat you really good. I said, if they can't treat me based on Jesus, and they, they don't, <laughs> but if they can't, I'm going to have whatever I get based on Jesus or I just won't have anything, you know. I mean, the friends I have, God will give them to me. The brothers and sisters I have, God will give them to me. And... And if he gives me three, that's more than most people have. Even if they've got ten great friends, they're not true friends. They'll turn on them too. You know what I mean? But when the Lord knits you together, when the Lord does something, when the Lord does something, doesn't matter what, about all the temporal shakings of that world out there. What matters is Christ is all and he's in all. And when all this is said and done, he's not going to remember all the faltering and all the failure. He's not going to remember the hard times when you felt like giving up. He's not. He's going to remember the times that you did stand. You say, well, how do you, where do you get that from? It's called Hebrews 11. Every one of those guys sound great. I mean, Samson's in there. Oh, and remember Samson and, and all the such like. Oh, you know, I'm going, you know, I'm not God, so I'm going, well, I'm remembering Samson, dude. And uh, what the heck are you thinking? But God's not marking all that stuff down. He says, you're one with my son. You're in Christ. You are, I always say this, you are born again. Or do you know the actual translation of that isn't born again? It's born from above. That's the actual trans. It's not really born again. It's born from above. You're in Christ. You're born in him. You've come into a new seed, a new life, and a new being. And so, you know, why does Jesus have to turn to his own disciples and say, oh, foolish ones and slow of heart? I'll tell you exactly why. Because... They think the cross is the end instead of the door. Most people are resisting the cross. They're resisting the, you know, the cross. I remember when I was in Bible school, and I remember hearing some people teach on it in my early days. I mean early. And some of the things I heard, I thought, you know, I don't think I want this cross thing. I mean, really, I mean, I, I was sincere. I, I thought, you know, I think I need to go to Kenneth Copeland's school. <laughs> you know, because I don't, you know, this doesn't really sound like fun to me. And, you know, it really didn't sound like fun. <laughs> but the longer I got into it, the reality came to me that the cross is the answer for all of the problems I have. I saw it as the door into a whole new realm of living and what I call, or what the scriptures actually call, what David called, the land of the living. That's what it was. The cross was this door and opened up. This is the land of the living. This is, it springs eternal here. I mean, it buds with the life of Christ in every one of these branches. What a, what a, you know, so I, I just go to that door and go, <laughs> I just kissed it. I just said, man, this is, thank you, gee. And not only that, but all, all that was me just began to melt off as I passed through that door into Christ. I decreased and he increased thanks to that cross. And it was like, you know, but here's, here's one thing. Until you really see how bad you are, isn't that the truth? You, I mean, the worse you see yourself, the more you're going to appreciate the cross. I'm telling you the truth. I'm telling you the truth. I'm not, this isn't just teaching and I'm not <laughs> doctrinalizing here. This is fact. The deeper you see your need for Jesus, the greater that cross is going to be and the greater the resurrection is going to be. 
And, and so it's, it gets discouraging in the early part because in the early part, you know, Romans 7 is before Romans 8. Oh, wretched man is before. There is therefore now no condemnation. <laughs> you know? The, the, there was a revelation in both of those chapters. Romans 7, the revelation is, I am deeply messed up. The revelation in Romans 8, I am in Christ, and now he's my life. He's not fixing the messed up person. He is living in me. It's glorious. It's glorious. But Romans 7 is necessary. And walking with Jesus on this road while he says, you know, oh, foolish and slow of heart to believe. And he, he begins to say, all of your religious history with me up to this point counts for nothing. Now everything's on a brand new basis. And that basis is death, burial, and resurrection. So all the three years and all the things we did and all the stuff we lies we touched and all the food that we fed, it's over with on that front. Now I'm going to start dealing with you about how wretched you are until you're ready to say, okay, I love this cross, and then enter into a whole new life. So, let's see, I need to finish the paragraph somewhere here because maybe I did. At least until we finish this road, we must not let our old familiar view of him keep us from finding him in this new way. Okay, we're going to go ahead and end there because uh, that, that's a great sentence. At least until we finish this road, we must not let our old view of him keep us from finding him in this new way. When someone told me that all that I had experienced with Jesus for my three and a half years, and it was less than that really, but before I was brought to this road to Emmaus, that it was actually didn't really count on this new level. The new level was now death, burial, and resurrection and how he dealt with us based on that and how that's always the eternal perspective. I thought, well, that can't be right. And here's why. I mean, I prayed for a blind man up on our, our street, Jefferson Boulevard, that sat there from when I was a little kid up, a little, uh, an old black man that sold pencils. And, you know, he was blind and sat in a little chair and sold pencils and stuff like that. And I went and prayed for him. And he got healed and got up and walked and never came back. And I've got a story. Out. My mother had cancer on her face. And I prayed for her. And the next morning it was gone. I can go on and on and on. And I went, you know, how can this be no longer important? Because it made me feel like I was really something special. I can't explain to you. I can only tell you that my reaction was probably normal, but that eventually the Lord showed me this truth, that the cross, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ is his eternal way of dealing with his sons now, his sons and daughters, those who are his bride and his body. He has no other way of dealing with them. Does, does he still do? Yeah, of course he still does miracles and stuff. But none of that is based on the eternal dealing. You know? Paul said, what things were gained to me, and he spoke of all the religious things that he had before he came to the cross. Now I count it all loss. <laughs> For the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. Oh, yeah, of Jesus, or of Jesus walking away. No, no, of Christ Jesus, my Lord, by whom I am crucified unto the world, and the world unto me. That's what he said in Galatians. If I glory, I will glory in the cross. And then he defines that cross, not something Jesus did for, for taking my sins away, 
but by which I am crucified to the world and the world unto me. He was glorying in a cross that got rid of him. Now, just because I say this stuff and just because I've had this experience doesn't make it, I'm going to say it like this, doesn't make it true. What really makes it true is when you start believing it. Not seeing it. When you start believing it, you'll start seeing it when you, but there is a period of time of this whole Roman 7 thing and this whole walk of Emmaus where you just have to just get stubborn and believe the truth in the face of stuff that says the opposite. And, and you just have to knuckle down and say, you know what? I'm going with the Lord. I cast my lot with him. My portion is in the Lord. And I give up all that. I give up my pride. I give up my right to have a right to argue <laughs> with the Lord. And I say, yes, Lord. Yes, 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 yes. You know? I mean, I, I hear us sing that song sometimes. I'll say, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, yes. And we're, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes. You know, I mean, it's when I say, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, 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 yes. And I'm like screaming, the devil's, oh, you know. You know. <laughs> okay, I get it. I think I get where you're coming from. Will we slip? Will we fall? Will we have, you know, and I'll, I'll close with this one. But I love that scripture says, the steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord, and though he fall. Wait a minute. If your steps are ordered of the Lord, what's this fall stuff? Never, you know, I've heard, I've heard that quoted a million times in churches. And nobody ever points out, though he fall. They make it sound like you won't fall. The steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord, and the Lord actually lets you fall. Because how are you going to learn to get up? How are you going to, and I mean get up in faith. How are you going to learn unless you've got the weight of the world on you and you finally just have to stand up and say, Lord, you don't seem to be taking this, so I'm going to take my place in faith with you. If nothing else, if it doesn't do anything else, if it doesn't remove a thing, change anything in this earth, if nothing else, at least maybe it'll bring you glory that I'm standing with you while falling. <laughs> Amen? Okay, well, let's get out of here. See, the kid's drawing was better than mine. <laughs>